lecture, we took a look at one mode of transfer, one mode of data transfer that was essentially programmed I O. I also explained why it was called programmed I O, because essentially by running a program, the CPU affects an input output, right. And the way you would, uh, uh, the way the CPU will deal with the device entirely depends on the program, it can be changed any time that is wanted, right. Now, what was the essential thing about the program DIO? We saw essentially that the CPU first addresses a device, right, that is too general a term. We will see which part uh, in the device it addresses, because there can be many parts which can be addressed, fine. Then, essentially it addresses the device. Uh, by that we mean it selects one of the devices, because there can be many devices on the bus, right, as marked here, just the interface part of it is marked, um, that is the I O 1 up to N, there can be any number. So, this uh, CPU selects one of these, right, one of these devices and then it essentially first checks its status. Now, the status of the device Okay, that information will give whether the device is ready for a data transfer. Now, if ready, the CPU will do the data transfer. This is essentially the crux of the whole thing about the programmed I/O. Fine. Now, if not ready, what it will do? Possibly, the CPU, when it finds one device is not ready, possibly it will keep checking the other devices. And so, basically the CPU polls among these devices. So, we also said programmed I O also means po device polling, right, fine. Now, the important thing here is the CPU takes the initiative and does it, agreed. So, this is important. The CPU takes the initiative, the CPU does not take initiative, there is not going to be any data transfer, okay, fine. Now, when the CPU takes the initiative, first it has got to check whether the device is ready. Now, all these uh, things that is addressing the device and then checking whether it is ready or not, these really do not contribute for the actual input or output, because the actual input or output is with reference to the data transfer. Now, we said data transfer essentially, it can be an input or output. So, CPU to I O, if it goes, then it is output. I O to CPU, then it is called input. Either way, it's a, it is a transfer. Okay, so you can see that the CPU is tied up with this activity of checking. Right now, before you go into the second mode of uh, pro, uh, data transfer, this is the first mode. Okay, before we go into the second mode of I O transfer, there are only essentially three modes. We will see that. Before that, I would like to say a few words, uh, basically recall some of what we had seen. We said there would be a status register and one of the bits would be checking whether the device is ready. There can be many, uh, many more bits in that particular status register, fine. Now, that is one aspect. Now, then we also said there will be a data buffer, another register, right. Essentially, the data buffer assembles the data so that the at the bus transfer rate, the data transfer can be affected, so that the CPU will be uh, utilized to its maximum. Okay, we also saw that through an example. 
uh, of an one bit data production and an eight bit data transfer between CPU and IO. Fine. Now, how about in case the CPU um, wants to say define okay, the function of an IO? What do you mean by that? Now, in this particular one, the CPU checks the status of the device. Suppose if CPU can dictate to the device what it should do, right? Now, CPU cannot tell a device, okay, now you are ready, not that kind of a thing. But CPU, for instance, can configure uh, that is, def uh, define some function of IO in case the IO is, let us say, a multi function or a multi purpose, okay. Suppose the particular IO is a multi function uh, interface, right. Uh, what type of uh, thing? We will assume some simple thing. That is, an IO is uh, either capable of transferring 4 bits or 8 bits, okay, uh, or 16 bits at a time, or possibly uh, something like, uh, uh, let us say, uh, one part of this IO will be configured as an input, another part will be configured as an output. Okay? Now, all these things would mean the IO is essentially a multi function, in which case right, the CPU can send some code to the IO and then define what that particular IO will be doing. Okay? So, that is possible by having in the interface circuitry, remember we saw um, the previous lecture status register, data buffer, all these as part of the interface circuitry. Now, similarly, for instance, the in, uh, interface circuitry can have a command register added to it, okay? a command register added to it, so that the CPU can issue an appropriate command to tell which of this multifunction that particular device will carry out at a given time, right? Then you can see that the status register which we saw earlier is essentially for reading the information from the interface, whereas a command register is a register into which CPU can write in, agreed? That is, if you say the status register Okay. The status register is essentially for reading the information from that. Okay. So, sometimes <coughs> you may have only read only function from that register. Okay. So, that is what it is. Then, command register is essentially for writing into. What do you mean by that? That is, CPU writes a command into the register. CPU reads status information from the register, right? Since CPU and the interface circuitry will either involve in read or write only, sometimes what happens is this function will be combined and there may be a single register. Why? Because when CPU addresses, if it issues a read command, then it would mean reading the status. If the CPU issues a write command, obviously it means CPU is writing some command into it. So, that physically this can be combined and there can be a single register also. Right? Now, if an IO can be, rather if an IO function can be specifically defined, if the IO supports, right, then we say that CPU configures that particular IO. So, this phase is called a configuration phase. What is that? The CPU addresses the IO and the CPU addresses the IO and then defines or configures that particular IO. It says what function it will be doing. 
essentially that configuration is by writing a specific command word into that register. Okay. Now, once the configuration is done, then next phase is only data transfer. Okay. So, essentially in any I O, especially if the I O is a multifunction type, okay, then we have these two phases involved. And uh, these days for any I O device, any I O device, there will be a specific interface chip. Right. Uh, generally, that particular chip is called a peripheral chip. For instance, you may have come across that term microcomputer peripheral. What is a microcomputer peripheral? Okay. Essentially, it is nothing but the interface circuitry in a microcomputer system which interfaces with the bus of the microcomputer system and the device on this side okay that is that is nothing but a peripheral device okay so if that's a peri there is a peripheral device then this is called peripheral in fact the peripheral if you come across the term peripheral it means only this interface the interface circuitry the chip part of it not this to denote this generally we would say peripheral device whereas this is called a peripheral fine so the CPU first will configure the peripheral, which means peripheral chip, right, by writing a command into it. That would uh, just uh, uh, like we saw in this case of status register in which uh, uh, ready is one bit. Similarly, in the case of command register, there may be many bits, and uh, setting or resetting these bits. That is precisely what is done during configuration phase, and then. Once you configure, as, and whenever the device is ready, uh, the CPU will do the transfer. Fine. Now this is somewhat related to the input output, so I thought I would mention before I go on to the second mode of uh, data transfer. What is that? Now in the first one, the CPU takes the initiative and checks whether it is ready, and so there is going to be some delay. Why it is possible that the device was already ready for quite some time it has been waiting and the CPU is not uh, really checking it. So, there is a possibility right because when does the CPU check? The CPU checks as per the given program which it runs. There is a program according to that program only it will go and check whether the device is ready. So, there is a possibility that device is already ready and CPU does not know mainly because it has not gone and checked that. That is why we say CPU must take the initiative and do it. Okay. It is up to the system design concern to make sure that no device is idling, CPU is fully utilized, memory is fully utilized, etcetera, etcetera. But then there will always be situations which cannot be foreseen. So, the other thing in which the wait period that is the device is ready, but CPU is not checking it. Okay, there is a delay or we may say the device is waiting for a transfer. So, to reduce that we have the second mode of data transfer and that is called an interrupt driven technique. Okay, as you can uh, interrupt driven mode or just interrupt driven I O. As you can, as you would have guessed by now, thus <coughs> the interrupt is the device when it is ready, that is when the I O is ready, right, immediately it will inform the CPU by what? Because possibly CPU is doing something else. So, it will be interrupting the CPU and informing, okay, I am ready. Fine? Good. So, that is what it is. So, in this particular one, we can say that the device takes the initiative and informs the CPU, and for this purpose, there must be a special line, interrupt line, right? So, that must be part of this bus. Good. So, uh, 
we may say that CPU gets and that is uh, only one part of the bus I am uh, showing gets uh, an information uh, gets the information right we will call this int or interrupt input. So, I O that is the device is ready it indicates that the I O interface is generating and interrupts the CPU. Now, what was CPU doing and what will be its response on receiving this interrupt input? Interrupt is an input signal is it not? Interrupt is an input signal to the CPU and is generated when the device is ready. And what is the relationship between the CPU clock and the device? What is the relation between that? Yeah, two independent things. Okay. So, we say that interrupt is an asynchronous signal, meaning it is not synchronized with the clock of the system. Is it not? Any time, any time when the device is ready, the device will generate the signal and there is no synchronization between the clock of this and when this will be generated, any time it can come, agreed. Now, if CPU is busy doing something, what do we mean by CPU be, uh, being busy? The CPU is executing some instruction, that is it is going through an instruction cycle, right? What is an instruction cycle consist of? It consists of machine cycle. It can machine cycle consists of states. Recall that. So, halfway through an instruction cycle, you can say that is any time during an instruction cycle, the interrupt input can come, can arrive. Right? When should the CPU be permitted to get interrupted? Because if you just uh, allow the CPU to be interrupted. Right, the whatever the CPU is doing, that particular thing may be lost. Right, CPU cannot respond immediately. Fine. Now that we will come to a little later. Now on receiving the interrupt request, that is interrupt uh, input, the CPU at some convenient time will generate an acknowledge. Generally, it is called an interrupt acknowledge signal. Okay, so that is interrupt acknowledge signal. This essentially means the CPU has taken note right of the incoming interrupt. So, this particular thing should go to the device. Now, this int input and int a outputs, they are actually two signals on the bus, are they not? Okay. One is an int input Okay, which goes to the CPU and another one is interrupt output which comes from the CPU. Now, these really go over the bus means they are being watched or noticed by all the devices, they are it is in public domain right. <laughs> Any device can notice that, is it not? Now, uh, suppose two devices generate interrupt. Right? If two devices generate interrupt, now one simple way is you can always have two interrupt input signals and connect one device each, but then how long you can go on multiplying, right? We will come to these various uh, things a little later. So, we will just take that there is one interrupt input signal to the processor and then there is an one, there is one interrupt acknowledge from the processor. So, these go actually over the bus. So, it is not only going to one device, but it also goes to other devices, because it is part of the bus signal. Okay? Fine. So, an interrupt request comes from the device, when? Not when CPU goes and checks, when the device is ready, the interrupt input comes. So, in other words, the device is taking the initiative and the CPU will be interrupted at an appropriate time. The most appropriate time, when is it? It is at the 
n of an instruction cycle. Agree? Because at the end of an instruction cycle, that particular at the end of an instruction cycle, that particular instruction would have been executed, okay, would have been executed and all the uh, necessary information to continue the next instruction will all be available with the processor. So, really speaking, the interrupt will be acknowledged at the end of an instruction cycle. This is one convenient time, agreed? So, generally we say that uh, uh, this kind of acknowledging interrupt and a few more things, right? Generally, these are part of what we may call as uh, service, meaning uh, the CPU keeps looking for these things uh, in anticipation of servicing say some device or something. Okay? So, this is in fact a service phase. Right? As part of service phase, it will check whether there is an interrupt which may have come during an instruction cycle for which an appropriate account must be generated at the end of it. Good. Fine. So, the interrupt driven I go. Now, if there is only one device which interrupts, there is no problem I said, but if there are multiple devices, okay, suppose you have got multiple devices, I mean which is a very valid uh, situation, is it not? Multiple devices and if you just have only one interrupt input, then precisely what we mean is we have possibly another or more. I O, which also makes use of the same interrupt input, right? So on. Now, obviously, what we mean by that is, uh, and what is the relation between these two? These two devices will be independent, right? Just as we said earlier, when CPU is doing something, the device may be ready, and the moment it is ready, it will interrupt. It is also possible the same way that these two devices being independent, they may generate the interrupt when they are ready and it is also possible that simultaneously they are ready and both of them are putting a, putting a request. And this device may be a printer and that device may be a plotter or whatever it is, okay. whatever be the device and I O devices being very much different in their configuration, function, okay, the way the signals must be sent, etcetera. That, that is the form in which the data must be sent to these. The CPU will be having different device routines, right? For multiple devices, that is for different devices, it will have different device routines. Essentially, since uh, these device routines are executed in response to an interrupt, generally this is, these are also called interrupt routine or device interrupt service routine and so on, they are interrupt routines. Meaning the CPU was carrying out some program execution, we will call it as a main program. That main program has been interrupted and a device must be serviced because a device says it is ready. And this device routine would be different from this device routine. In other words, the CPU must know which device has interrupted because this, these routines are different, device routines are different. Okay? The CPU must choose the appropriate routine and execute it. That is, it has to stop the main program and go to the appropriate program associated with that. What does it mean? It means essentially the interrupting device must identify itself. So, it is not enough if a device interrupts. The device, the interrupting device must identify itself. That is, the, there must be an identification phase. Agree? How can it be done? Identification. There are two ways. One is the moment the CPU gets an interrupt input, at the end of the instruction cycle, 
it can acknowledge and then while acknowledging the CPU can check this device are you ready the same way what is it earlier we did program diver no the same way right except that the CPU is not checking on its own the CPU is responding to an interrupt that is the difference otherwise the CPU can check while generating the interrupt acknowledge that is while generating the acknowledge is this device ready or is this device ready and so on that is one possibility. Okay? The other possibility is the CPU generates an interrupt acknowledge and it is up to the device which it is inter uh, which interrupted the CPU. Let us uh, not worry for the moment when more than one device has interrupted. Okay? Suppose only one of the devices is interrupted, then it is uh, on receiving the interrupt acknowledge the device which has interrupted the CPU can generate an identification code. Okay? Generally that identification code is called a vector. What is it? Essentially, it is this particular thing is going to point to where its device service routine is available. Is it not? Essentially, the whole exercise is for the CPU to know which device ser service routine must be executed. And that service routine is different from for different devices. Right? So, this identification code which generally is called a vector, the vector points to say device service routine 1 in this case or device service routine 2 in this case and so on so forth. Because it comes through interrupt, they are also called interrupt service routine or just interrupt routine or whatever it is. Okay? Now, this is one way. So, a device may generate and put an interrupt request on a common thing on a common uh, input okay? and CPU may go ahead and poll among the devices to see which is ready and then service it or the CPU generates an interrupt acknowledge, interrupt acknowledge and the IO device identifies itself. Right? Now, if more than one device had interrupted because there is certainly going to be some delay between the time when interrupt has been generated and interrupt acknowledge comes because only at the end of the instruction cycle the acknowledgement comes no so there is going to be some delay agreed so during that period if another device has been ready or let us say two devices were simultaneously ready it's uh, the situation is same so first an interrupt has been generated and before interrupt acknowledge has uh, been generated by the CPU at the end of the cycle, uh, another device is ready. Suppose two devices are ready. What can be done? Huh? If you adopt the second scheme in which on interrupt acknowledge the device identifies, then both the devices which are ready will identify, then there will be problem. Is it not? Fine. There will be problem. So, <coughs> The, there must be some way in which we can resolve among these various devices. So, we talk about what is known as priority among these devices. That is, you have got to assign some priority among these devices. So, that let us say this device has a higher priority and this device has a lower priority, in which case the higher priority device will be having the service first, the lower priority will have to wait. Of course, one can keep changing this priority. All right. Now, where exactly this uh, identification code or vector will be placed? Now, that is one thing. Where? Essentially, it is a code which should identify the start address of the device uh, routine is it not? So, this particular code the best place for the and where is it? It is generated by the respective devices. So, the best place for this is 
the IOR device places this code on the data bus and CPU reads it in. Okay? The code better placed on the data bus and the CPU reads it in. Essentially, it is a code which gives the start address of this device service routine. So, that, that particular routine can be started and executed. Fine. Now, this is one thing. Another scheme, what is that? Uh, whatever I mentioned earlier, you can have multiple interrupt inputs. Now, here I have shown two different interrupt inputs. So, in which case possibly say in this case, I will remove this, if I connect this to this, huh? no problem. No? When int 1 is generated, CPU knows this device has interrupted. When int 2 is generated, the CPU knows this device has been generated. Right? Now, you can see that by having multiple interrupt inputs, essentially I have hardwired right i have hardwired the prior uh, no not priority i have hardwired the information because when int1 is generated this has this device it's identified immediately because there is only one device i mean at least in this particular scheme now it's again possible that both int1 and int2 are generated simultaneously is it not because these two devices are independent. So, both these could again then we must ta come to this priority part of it. So, among this into I mean between these uh, two inputs into and into one the priority must be defined. Okay, that is not a problem. So, now I can hardwire the information about this code that is what is it? Code essentially tells the start address of the service routine, right? I can hard wire it by having uniquely one device for one, I um, mean connecting only one device on one interrupt line, then it is known, the CPU knows. Or alternately through software, right, is it not? Through software, the device can identify itself the start address of its service routine. Okay. Now, as you can see in this particular one, the uh, overhead to some extent is minimized. That is, in, a, in the sense, uh, okay, um, first the more important thing is, the moment the device is ready, the CPU can be informed, right? And CPU by itself does not go and spend some time. So, this way the overhead is reduced. But then, in the practical situation, you cannot have many interrupt inputs. So, there is overheads involved because the device must identify and the CPU must know which service routine. To that extent, overhead is there. Okay? But then, <coughs> the response to any interrupt request, that is the response to any device which says, I am ready with the data or I am ready for accepting the data, either way. Right, that particular response can be certainly vastly improved. And then, by having this particular one, we are automatically walked into other uh, necessities such as priority and so on, because multiple interrupts, multiple priorities. Okay. Now, we will take a look at uh, the sequence at which this uh, uh, interrupt service can be. Yeah, I mean interrupt generation, uh, request acknowledgement, and service. Okay, what it all involves, and what it means in terms of the, uh, say, efficiency of the processor. Okay, now remember one thing: the processor is always doing something or other. That is, it either executes a main program, or it gets interrupted by a request, and then it is going to execute a yeah, service routine for a requesting device. right? So, either way it is just going to execute some program or other. Okay, If it is a main program, okay, the instruction cycle is corresponding to that. If it is a service program, then the instruction cycle corresponding to that. So, essentially 
the processor turns its attention from one program to another program. In other words, we say there is a switch, okay, there is a switch between uh, rather switch from one program execution to another program execution. Each program is supposed to create a specific context. So, we talk about a context switch, meaning the CPU switches its context from context from say main program to device service program 1 or main program to device service program 2. This context switch is not very much different from say going from uh, uh, main routine to a subroutine, the same thing. Instead here we are talking about a main program that CPU is engaged in some program and then from that it goes to a service program, device service program. Now uh, diagrammatically we can represent something like this. Now in course of time when a program is uh, getting executed, okay, as a program is getting executed and interrupt requests comes, so by this uh, what I mean is here is the our time axis. Okay, here is our time axis. So, some program is getting executed, an interrupt request comes. At the end of the current instruction cycle, the CPU turns its attention away from the main program. So, let us just say this is uh, the one related to the main execution. From this, it goes, it has to uh, go to execute a different program that is the device service program and at the end of it, it will come back to the main program and resume its main program. Okay. So, the CP is involved in executing some program and then it goes into execution of some service program. What service? Servicing the device. Now, you can see that uh, different types of uh, things are involved here. Number one, the interrupt, oh, oh, okay. Any program execution consists of taking an instruction one by one and doing. An instruction cycle consists of machine cycles and states, all these things we know. So, an interrupt request comes during an instruction cycle. At the end of the instruction cycle, possibly uh, the instruction cycle was started here, let us say. Okay. And during the instruction cycle, the request comes. And then at the end of the instruction cycle, Right, when the CPU goes and sees whether there is any pending input, uh, pending interrupt input request, right? It sees that there had been one, and then it changes. So now, uh, subsequently, the main program must be resumed and continued, is it not? So all the information related to the main program execution must be stored. Okay. So, these things will be usually stored in the stack area, right? All right. <coughs> so, all these things will have to be stored. So, first we can say that at the end of the instruction cycle, there is a switch from that is the suddenly the main program execution is stopped, that is number one. Whether the service program can be taken up or not, first it is stopped. And the first thing that will be uh, done is the CPU will spend some time, right? And then store all the information related to the main program execution, so that it can be used later on. And uh, sometime before or after, so it will have to identify which service program must be taken up, because there can be many devices. That is we may say identification of device, and then actually it executes the device service only for some duration. Right, and then at the end of this, this is precisely what we may call is what we may call as device service. Right, device service. At the end of the device service, what uh, which device is service? The one which interrupted. Right, at the end of it, the <coughs> whatever that was saved with reference to the main program will be restored, so that the main program can be resumed safely. So, you can see here that here in this particular thing, right? if I mark it as 
1. Then 1 corresponds to what we may call as interrupt latency time. What is that? That is the interrupt has come, but there is uh, the CPU is not yet ready to respond. Okay? Some time will have to be spent. There is nothing but so this whole thing is instruction cycle time. We may call it as the last instruction cycle before the context switch. Okay? So uh, not exactly the whole of it. This uh, not this actually. From here to here, this is what one must be. Huh? That is from the time the interrupt request has come to the time the context switch takes place or the end of that particular instruction, that is the best, end of that particular instruction cycle. So, that is interrupt latency time. And then here, if we mark it as 2, then you can say that uh, uh, saving hmm, main context, let us say. So, all the things, so that what do you mean by all the things? First thing, the program counter content, which says at what point of the main program it stopped. And then the set of registers, because registers are part of CPU, right? The CPU registers may be taken up for the other program. So they also have to be saved. And then any other, uh, uh, what we call as status related information for the main program. So, saving that. So, they have to be saved somewhere. Then 3, we are not very sure in specifically in what order it may come. 3 possibly, uh, let us say, identifying device. Uh, this identifying device is to know which service, device service routine can be taken up, right? Identifying the device. Now, about identifying device, I was talking about two things. One is, the device interrupts and when it interrupts, it identifies itself. Okay? Now, that uh, is, I said through a code. So, at the time of identifying itself, uh, I'm sorry, at the time of generating the interrupt itself, if it identifies, then we say the vector is very much part of the interrupt request itself. And so, this particular thing is generally known as a vector interrupt. Okay? There um, may be many ways in which it may be done. For instance, having a unique input signal line, one, one pin, and you connect one device. And the CPU knows that when an input, interrupt input comes to that particular input pin, then it knows where exactly the service program uh, is for that particular device. The other one is just not known at the time of interrupt, but then later on the CPU will have to ask the device okay, or the device may tell, in which case we call the second type of interrupt as non-vector interrupt, meaning at the time of interrupt request, it is not known right, which is the actual uh, say start address of that device service program. Okay? So, fine. So, some, some way in which the device must, uh, must be identified by the CPU, because then only the CPU knows uh, which program to run. Now, once it knows, then fourth is the device service. This is the, the fourth one okay, from spanning from here to here. This is the main thing as far as the interrupt service is concerned. So, we can call this as interrupt service. Hmm? And uh, this interrupt service, as I said, is something like your sub routine, okay, running a sub routine. So, main routine is here, so interrupt service routine is here. And then at the end of this, okay, at the end of this particular phase, that is when the uh, device has been serviced. Okay, this is in fact a device interrupt service. Okay, at the end of this particular one, then 
go back restore what all that has been saved so that the main program can be resumed okay at the end of it so the the fifth one would be uh, restoring uh, restoring uh, main context in fact context itself is used for uh, giving uh, enough information about uh, the state etc needed for running a specific program okay context means contents of all the registers etc that must be uh, resumed so what about that had been saved will be put back here and then at the end of it right the main program can be resumed here so resuming the main program okay it's as simple as this particular one. okay now you can see here that in 2 3 and 5 okay these intervals intervals 2 3 and 5 the cpu is not really involved in executing either this program or this program the main program or the service program so 2 3 and 5 really contribute to what we can call as overheads right overheads now that is preparing basically preparing the cpu so that it can take up the service of a device right but then it cannot be avoided now compare this with the programmed io in, in the programmed io the cpu by itself will go as per the program written right because the program is getting executed as per the program written the cpu goes and checks so it's possible that the device is ready but cpu is not checking it now that has been avoided here okay but still there is some time now in the in this uh, second one the interrupt driven io you can see that still there is some time involved there is a delay then we do not know maybe it's only a few nanoseconds depends now the best way to calculate this particular one is to see one of those instruction cycles which consumes the maximum time right so that is the worst case delay the worst case delay for a given processor will be is it not this particular delay that is number one which corresponds to the interrupt latency time so the worst case interrupt latency time is nothing but uh, the uh, maximum uh, what is it called maximum number of states for the longest instruction we can say okay uh, there is a maximum thing will be uh, <coughs> the number of states and then you have to multiply that by the time involved okay uh, maximum of uh, longest the whatever that time that is taken for the longest instruction hmm, execution because certain uh, instructions will be executed very fast basically we have got to look at the instruction which takes the longest time in, in fact this is we have to say it's time okay this is the thing so look for those instruction which takes the longest time and that particular thing okay you know we can since we have said the longest we can drop out the maximum of so this in fact corresponds to this and that sometimes may say go into quite a bit of maybe even a microsecond or two or three we do not know because we have got a, it may not really be so but then it's possible that when the interrupt request comes uh, the misfortune may be that the longest uh, instruction execution time that is what the instruction cycle consists of right so there is going to be some delay now the problem comes in case the device is very fast now normally we talk about device being slow but it so happens if the device is very fast that it cannot wait even for this particular latency time what is to be done nothing can really be done because essentially what we mean is 
the processor is slow right in the case of interrupt this is the only way it can be done you have to switch from one context to another context and that would involve overheads there is no other way in which you can reduce that so if you try to reduce I mean you just can't reduce it there is a problem another thing is this particular one okay so in case we have a device which is very fast that means, by the time you can switch from this to this, if the device loses the data, then the data is lost forever. Okay. So, in the case of very fast device, in interrupt scheme will not work and that is the reason why we go for the third mode of data transfer, which we will see in the next lecture.